Speaking, a monthly podcast on the spoken word. Episode number five, June 2018, an interview with David Crystal. Hi, this is Paul Meyer. David Crystal is my very special guest this month. David is an honorary professor of linguistics at the University of Bangor and works from his home in Hollyhead, North Wales, as a writer, editor, lecturer and broadcaster. He read English at University College London, specialised in English language studies, then joined academic life as a lecturer in linguistics, first at Bangor, then at Reading, where he became Professor of Linguistics. He received an OBE for services to the English language in 1995 and became a Fellow of the British Academy in 2000. Well, that short introduction really doesn't do justice to his immensely prolific career, with over 120 books to his credit. I first got to know him through his book, Pronouncing Shakespeare, which I read in 2005, just after he had documented the famous production of Romeo and Juliet at Shakespeare's Globe Theatre in, I think, 2004. I instantly fell in love with the whole concept of producing Shakespeare in original pronunciation and got to know David the following summer, And then we collaborated on my production of A Midsummer Night's Dream in 2010. It's been the highlight of my career to have this association with the famous David Crystal. David, thanks so much for sparing the time from your busy life to join me today on this fascinating topic. Let's jump straight in. You've said that pragmatics, something I'd never heard of until you introduced it to me a few years back, is the most exciting area of linguistics. I still know enough about it only to be dangerous. So tell me and tell us why you have said that pragmatics is the most exciting area. Well, Paul, it's it's all to do with the history of linguistics, really, because when you when you look at the way linguistics has developed over the past hundred years or so, you see a steady progression. So in the late Victorian period, people were studying sounds predominantly. It's when speech therapy came along, after all, and the International Phonetic Alphabet and sound change in language through philology. So it was sounds, sounds, sounds. And then, you know, a generation or so later, things moved on. And in the 1920s and 30s, people started studying word structure. Morphology came into being as a, as a subject in, the, in linguistics. And then another generation later, we get syntax coming along with people like Charles Carpenter Fries in the States, introducing us to the structure of English. And then Chomsky, of course, with syntactic structures. Exactly. So grammar comes along after phonology. And then after a little while, in the sort of 1970s and 80s, people thought, hang on a minute, there's more to language than just sounds and grammar. What about the meaning? You see, And so semantics comes along now. And the first big introduction to semantics come up during the 1970s and and 80s. And for many people, people thought, well, that's the end of the story. We've got the sounds, we've got the grammar, we've got the meaning, nothing more to be said. But there is something more to be said. If you can put it like this, up until that point, people studied the what of language, the actual objects, the forms, the when of language over time. The, the where of language, the sort of dialects and accents and things, but nobody had asked the question, why? Why are we using a particular form of language in the way we use it? And it is this search for an explanation that led to the subject of pragmatics. If you want a definition of pragmatics, well, there are many, of course, around, but, but mine is this. It's the study of the choices that you make when you use language, the reasons for those choices and the effects that the choices convey. So it's a three-part definition, really. And and when you look at pragmatic books, you find that they differ quite a bit in content because some people focus on the choices, some people focus on the reasons, and some people focus on the effects. But you need all three. Mm -hmm. And in a word, what you're looking for here are explanations as to why people use language in the way they do. And that's why I think it's the most exciting area in linguistics. Are the rules or the protocols that we often unconsciously employ when we speak, do you think the the average person is completely unaware of those unwritten rules, those invisible protocols? Oh, I think in a lot of cases, it's totally unconscious because they are introduced to us at a very, very early age, you know, around about the age of three or so parents start 
giving pragmatic rules to their kids like, you know, I, I don't want to hear those naughty words or don't talk with your mouth full or, 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 a, or a, I want that little word, please. If, Mummy, can I have a biscuit? I haven't heard the little word yet. You know, can I have a biscuit, please, mummy? That sort of thing is taught very, very early on. And so by the time you get to be an adult, it is largely unconscious. So some pragmatic things are conscious. When I'm writing a letter or an email or something, I consciously decide whether to make the email or letter formal or informal using all the devices in the language that are available, like saying I am rather than I'm, you know, that kind of contrast. But an awful lot's um, completely unconscious. And how, I, how about this, David? If um, if the roles were switched today, and I, I wasn't the the humble interlocutor, but the subject of this, this discussion, and you were the interviewer, how, how would each of us behave differently with a different context? Well, that, that's also part of pragmatics, because pragmatics is the study of audience or readership. And you tune your language to your sense of the relationship you want to convey or, or to elicit in the interaction that's taking place. So if I felt I wanted to be uh, a very authoritative, aggressive, dominant figure, I choose one set of options. If I wanted to give the impression that if you and I were really the best of friends and old mates and so on, I choose a different set of options. So it's, it's a matter of, of a, a sense of mutual appropriateness that comes to light here. Now, normally people get this right. So two people who meet for the first time will have a sense of their relationship to each other and will make similar sorts of choices. Uh, sometimes it goes wrong. Uh, so I don't know about you, but um, often I get a phone call from somebody who wants to sell me something and the phone call begins you know hello is that david and i don't know this guy from adam you know and i say i say yes he says, well um, i and then he like tries to sell me some insurance well you know he's obviously been trained use the first name but to many people that's far too invasive and, and far too over familiar and as a result, uh, I put the phone down, you know, exactly. so it didn't work in that particular case. His pragmatic choices were wrong compared with my pragmatic expectations. So it does sometimes go wrong. And some people have deficits in this area, don't, don't they? People on the, the autism spectrum often cannot tune in to those, those rules. It's one of the big defining features in, in speech pathology. It's often called a, a pragmatic disorder rather than an autistic one because autism is a much broader <coughs> concept. Um, a pragmatic difficulty disorder, handicap, call it what you will, mm -hmm. is one where you don't have a sense of the appropriateness rules that allow an interaction to continue. So, for example, you talk too much, for instance, or you don't talk enough, or you interrupt in inappropriate ways, or you take uh, sentences too literally. I remember a lovely example once when I was observing in a clinic uh, years ago at Reading, and there was a speech therapist uh, working with a little, a group of pragmatic kids. And she was working with one. There was a knock on the door. And in comes another lad who had a pragmatic problem. And she said, I can't see you yet, Jonas. Uh, sit there for a minute, will you? So Jonas sits down, looks at his watch, waits for a minute, and then gets up and goes out. Of course, what she meant was, wait there until I have some time for you. What he interp interpreted very literally was, I must wait for one minute and only one minute, and then I must go away. What I, thought you, what I thought you were going to say is when she said, I can't see you now, he would have a difficulty <laughs> wondering if he was visible or not. Well, you know, that's the other, the other sort of thing. I, uh, you know, lots of examples like this. Um, <laughs> I visited a school once on the Isle of Wight, and uh, they sent a 12-year-old young lad who had a pragmatic problem to meet me in the car park and show me where the head's room was. And as we walked along, I you know, made some remark, and he didn't answer. And then he thought for a moment and turned to me and said, do you like being married? <laughs> and out of this 12-year-old, you know, I, I mean, I was the nonplussed one then. I had no idea what to say. Now, where he had got that idea from that, that a question about marriage was an appropriate introductory part of a conversation I've no idea but this is the sort of thing that happens you get a sense of inappropriateness a sense of 
of uh, unbalance. Something has gone wrong in the expectations of the interaction. You and I, like most Brits, have have a variety of little accent and dialect shifts that we can do, and we can code shift. And I mean, I was I was brought up brought up in Hampshire, and I, I'm fairly sure that my my earliest accent was 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 <laughs> was, was was fairly rustic. But my mother, you know, was a very much aspiring middle class, and so I think she quickly knocked that out of me. But I can still slip into the Hampshire, or I can do the RP. Uh, and you know, and then when I w- we moved to London to avoid getting beaten up on a playground, I could I could slip into the into the local patois there, and I oh. suspect that you, as, a, as being born in Northern Ireland and being Welsh, you've had similar experiences of when to pragmatically change the shape of a vowel. Yes, and these are very unconscious experiences. I hardly ever find myself deliberately doing it. And I'm not sure, actually, that I would be able to consciously switch in a very natural sort of way. It's all all to do with accommodation, isn't it? As the sociolinguists say, um, one accommodates to the accent of the person one is talking to, either going more towards their accent if one is getting on well with them or diverging from it if one is not getting on well with them. Yes, I can do this as well. Reflecting my background, I can... I can do a, quite a lot of accents and dialects as long as I've studied them, analysed them. I'm not an impressionist. I'm not like some of those brilliant television guys who can just switch on an accent and be a Trump or an Obama or something with no trouble at all. You know, I can't do that. Um, I have to analyse the accent first and then work it out and then systematically learn it. And then I can do it quite well. Yes. M- most people have no idea of the extent to which they modulate their speech to the to the listener to the to the social circumstance no that's that's true and it sometimes takes people aback it it even takes me aback every every now and again i I remember once i was up in glasgow at a conference and listening to a chap from glasgow talking about the arts and i agreed with him totally and then in the interval i met him and as I started talking to him, you know, I suddenly realised that my speech was becoming more Glasgow-like. Uh, and, I, and I was starting like this suddenly, without realising it, you see. And was he yeah. accommodating to you as well? Well, no, because what he then said, he, he suddenly stopped me and said, are you from Glasgow? <laughs> and I didn't know what to say. Uh, so I said, yes. <laughs> and he said, which part of Glasgow? <laughs> I said, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know Glasgow at all, really. And I, I sort of turned it into a joke and said, "No, no, I'm not. I'm not from Glasgow at all." And, and, and he said, well, "Why are you taking the Mickey out of the out of my Glack, my accent for then?" You know. Uh, and we got to talking about it, and it all ended happily, and I didn't get beaten up or anything. But you know, it can, it can take you by surprise that you do slip into an accent in this way. Exactly. Let, let's talk a little bit more about accommodation, which I find absolutely fascinating. And I think it was one of your books that turned me on to it in the first place, that um, we tune into each other. If you, if you like the person you're speaking to, both of you start to slip into each other's style of speech. There's a sort of agreement, isn't there? And you slip mm. into the same tempo, the same volume, presumably, and perhaps a little bit of the same accent. Oh, uh, yeah, and, and, uh, and dialect, too. I mean, if one person uses a particular form of words, a particular favorite expression to talk about the subject that both people are talking about, the other person will will slip into it also, and unless there's something controversial, of course, there. Um, similar types of, of syntactic structure, uh, similar body language even. You know, if one person suddenly starts putting a hand on a hip, the other person might put a hand on a hip. You know, it's very subtle. Yes. All- yes. One of my mother's brothers, one of my favorite uncles i never saw him accommodate in his life he seemed to be so self-confident and had learned the role he wanted to play in life that regardless of to whom he was speaking he never seemed to shift and this over time started to bother me i I noticed this and i thought you know I, i didn't have the word for it at the time but if i had i would have said why why doesn't he tune into us a little better? Well, that sounds like a pragmatic problem of some sort then, doesn't it? Because, because that's one of the features of people, kids or adults, who have pragmatic difficulties, that they don't tune in in this way. And they have, you know, a, a single style 
as it were, which they use in all circumstances. And one of the things that happens in therapy, of course, is to try and get them to see, first of all, to comprehend that there are these stylistic differences and then see if we uh, we can develop their expressive range, as it were, as a a consequence. So it's not simply someone who's just so super confident that he he doesn't defer to the other person. It's, well, it might, it might be. I mean, who, who knows? Without, without doing a case study, as it were, it's difficult, difficult to say. Yeah. Um, one, one would need to see the guy in all the circumstances of his life uh, in order to be sure that there wasn't the kind of variation that you didn't sense as a kid looking up to an adult, you know. Yes, he, he was going back to my mother's preoccupation with RP and the abandonment of her Hampshire roots. There were nine siblings in her family, and about half of the boys and girls, um, half of my uncles and aunts, stayed rooted and seemed very happily rooted in Hampshire. But but four or five of them went to grammar school and had this middle-class aspiration, and he was one of them. And uh, it, it, it was almost as if he had learned how to escape his roots and and not, mm. not betray his origins, mm. that that he, he, he couldn't then slip back into something more more informal, as he might have defined it. Mm. Very interesting. It would be interesting to know whether he, he had any kind of uh, stylistic variation in his uh, his written work, you know, his, in, in his writing. Yes. Uh, he, would, he was able to write informal letters, for instance, and things like that. Yes. It's very unusual. I mean, almost a mark of di- of disability, I think, if somebody mm-hmm. lacks any kind of accommodation. Um, so if aware. any of our listeners were to say to us, uh, David, Paul, I never change. I give the same face to the world no matter whom I'm talking to. That- I'd be very surprised. <laughs> very surprised indeed. If any of our listeners are anxious to start noticing the accommodations and pragmatic choices they make, what what would you have them look out for in their own behaviour? Well, an awful lot of accommodation, uh, uh, sorry, an awful lot of pragmatic uh, issues are to do with politeness, or its opposite, of, of course. Uh, the little kids saying please and, and thank you, uh, uh, gre- greetings for the time of day, you know, hello, how are you, what do you talk about, what is a safe subject for conversational um, interaction to proceed, uh, whether one should swear or not, and if so, what kind of swearing, um, the greetings that one uh, gives to everybody during the day. I mean, these are all governed by sometimes quite subtle, pragmatic rules. I mean, take the, the difference between good morning and good night, uh, for example. Are you aware of this, Paul, the, the pragmatic difference between the two? Most people aren't. The issue is that you say good morning to an individual person just once, whereas you can say good night to an individual person as often as you like. So if I meet you in the morning and I'm walking along the corridor and I say, good morning, Paul, and you say good morning to me, and a few minutes later I pass you again, I don't then say good morning, Paul, a second time. Hmm. And if I did, you'd feel very worried about this and think, am I so unimportant that he didn't notice me the first time or what? So what about and the good some, night? What about the good night? But then? in good night, it's quite the opposite. So I'm, I pass you as I'm leaving you, and I say, "Oh, good night, Paul." Oh, I've forgotten my bag. I go back to the office. I see you again. Hey, good night, Paul. That's all right, isn't it? And say that. I never yes. noticed that. And, and it's like hello and goodbye. You see, again, one says hello to a person just once. Unusual to say hello, 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 or something like that. Although it's always possible jocularly. But when you're saying goodbye, you know, you can say, hey, bye, 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 as many yes. times as you like. God be with you, God be with you, God be with you. Yeah, well, exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an example of the sort of unconscious kind of uh, of rule. And somebody who has problems with pragmatics would perhaps not greet at all or over greet or under greet. Fascinating, fascinating. It is a fascinating subject, and, and that's why I find it so exciting, because most of these pragmatic rules still remain to be explored. I mean, an awful lot have now. It's, pragmatics has been around for 30 years or more, and there are journals of pragmatics that have articles on all this sort of thing. So slowly the knowledge base is building up. But there's a, a huge amount of um, both known unknowns and unknown unknowns, especially when it comes to comparing different languages intercultural pragmatics the sort of thing i mean here is that uh, i've been taught to 
speak French. And so I know that you say in French, s'il vous plaît, uh, for please. And because I'm a good, polite British guy, when I go to France, I say s'il vous plaît all the time. And then you notice, well, hang on, the French don't say it quite so often. Uh, and so sometimes a French person will ask you for something or in, in a restaurant, something might be asked for and s'il vous plaît is not being used. And you think that sounds rather abrupt, but apparently not. And, and conversely, if I keep saying s'il vous plaît, it sometimes sounds more insistent. S'il vous plaît, you know, as it were, you know, if you please. Yeah. Um, and it takes a we, long time to tune into those subtle cultural oh, yes. differences, doesn't it? Uh, this is all pragmatics as well. I've noticed in France that uh, people don't smile as much as perhaps in England or, or in America. So I suppose the, the smiling is, is a form of pragmatics, cultural pragmatics. Would you agree? Yes, yes, I would. And in some cultures, of course, the smiling can mean some very, very different things. Giggling and smiling can be a sign of embarrassment. For example, uh, in Japan, I often, when I'm giving a lecture, for example, and uh, suddenly I see everybody smiling and giggling, I think, oh, they like what I've just said. No, no, they're finding it a bit embarrassing or, or a bit unnerving what I've just said. Yes. Uh, so lots of differences like that. Here's an area I wanted to explore with you. You and I both have a tremendous amount to do with the theatre. And I remember distinctly being trained not to take my scene partner's tone of voice. And I, and I remember Tom Hanks talking about his scenes with Mark Rylance in Bridge of Spies. <laughs> yeah. uh, Tom Hanks reported that he had a devil of a time not falling into the same affect that Mark Rylance used so effectively as the, as the spy. <laughs> would and, it help? <laughs> would it help? Exactly. <laughs> and, I, and I remember thinking, well, we, we, we've been taught as actors, our tra at least my training of my generation was find your distinct note in the symphony of this play don't be seduced into the other person's tempo or volume. You know, maintain your own note in the symphony. But yet, if if the people, if the characters in the play uh, like each other, uh, surely they will accommodate. And won't we get a, a pretty much the same affect in certain conversations? Sh should so? My question is: How does the study of pragmatics affect acting theory? Well, that's a very interesting question and one that I don't think has been explored very much. Certainly, I, I, I haven't. But I mean, the, the, I think the important thing to notice straight away is that the features of accommodation that we notice when we are accommodating are a small subset of all the features that are involved in our speaking to each other. I can't quantify it. I can't put a figure on it, but not everything accommodates, as it were. Not everything changes. No. Um, in, in fact, it only needs a, a, a two or three small features to change in order to demonstrate or to express the the accommodation relationship that's emerging. So everything else is going to stay the same. So I wouldn't have thought that a, a, a modicum of accommodation is going to conflict with mm. that desideratum that you just mentioned. Yes. Now, of course, you know I'm a dialect coach and we've spent a lot of time doing OP together, original pronunciation together. I have come to mistrust productions in which every actor, presumably all their characters are using the same accent, the same dialect, but in which everyone seems to have been cut from the same cookie cutter. Another injunction that when I'm coaching, uh, I will point out to actors that people code switch a great deal from moment to moment. Sometimes they're in a self-deprecating mode. Sometimes they're in an assertive moment. And so the, the acting moment has to take the lead and not the dialect. Sometimes I get the feeling in dialect shows when people are speak, performing in a dialect not their own or an accent not their own, that there's something monolithic about, about their speech style and they don't allow the, the part to breathe, as it were. What do you think? Oh, uh, absolutely. Uh, because, because variability is at the heart of linguistic expression. I mean, everybody varies to some extent. Nobody is ever totally consistent in the way they speak. Except my uh, uncle. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm not even sure about that. Uh, no, you're quite right. Actually, you know, I wonder, I wonder. But especially these days when people have moved about so much and are exposed 
to so many different kinds of accents and dialect through the internet and television and films and all the rest of it. Variability, by which I simply mean, you know, not entirely consistent usage, whether it's sounds or grammar or vocabulary or anything, is increasingly the norm. And I know some people say, uh, you know, I don't like it. I should not, I would always aim for consistency. But in fact, everybody is inconsistent to some extent, whatever the feature is. Sometimes I say bath, sometimes I say bath. I never quite know what's going to come out next. Sometimes I say, for example, sometimes for example. Depends partly on who I'm talking to. Then I would say uh, schedule all the time. Talking to my kids, all of whom have been influenced by American pronunciation, they all say schedule. So some I usually say schedule accommodate to them and schedule to Hillary accommodating to her. But sometimes I forget or sometimes it uh, it just goes out of my mind and I say schedule to the one and schedule to the other. Now, this doesn't worry me at all. But that kind of inconsistency is, is perfectly normal in my view. But it does worry some people. It does. They, they, they feel I should I should be the same person all the time. I, what's the right pronunciation of this? <laughs> And of course, you and I know through our work with OP that, uh, that how very, very quickly pronunciations change and go in and out of fashion, new tuners of accents and all of that. Is this a good time to jump into our into our Shakespeare? Yeah, it could be, because the OP is a, is a very good example of um, what we're talking about, because that was one of the questions that the actors always asked me when we started working on an OP project. Must we all speak in the same way? To which the answer was, well, you're all using the same sound system, but you'll all use it in different ways, depending upon your personal background and your personal accent and your voice quality and so on. And I would say to them, look, we're all sitting in this room. We're all speaking modern English, but no two of us are speaking it in exactly the same way in terms of accent. I mean, Uh, and that's fine. It's the modern English sound system with your local accent, background, whatever, superimposed on that. Keep that, because that's part of your natural identity. And the same point applies, I think, to uh, when you're reconstructing Shakespearean uh, or any other older form of original pronunciation that one mustn't expect. Just because you're using an older sound system doesn't mean to say that everybody's going to articulate phonetically each of those units of sound, each of those phonemes, in exactly the same way. Would you say that it's been universal throughout human history that the older generation decries the the accent of the younger generation? Uh, It's certainly been a very normal thing since the 18th century and, and prescriptive politeness class attitudes evolved so dramatically. But yes, since then, every generation thinks that there was a golden age where everybody spoke better, did better, you know, than the current younger generation. And when the younger generation becomes old, they say the same thing. It was ever thus. That's got to be of comfort to old fogies like us who perhaps don't care for every new feature of the of the language that emerges in the people 50 years our junior. Yeah, I mean, the, criti- the criticisms that were made in generation number one are forgotten about by generation number three. I mean, if you go back 100 years, for instance, one of the biggest talking points in the late Victorian era was this awful new pronunciation of the word balcony. Um, people are people are pronouncing it balcony. It's disgusting, absolutely disgusting. And there's lots of discussion along exactly these lines. Of course, you know. <laughs> two generations on what <laughs> why <laughs> ever a problem and similarly the things that are uh, uh, causing people upset today in pronunciation and grammar and everything else in, in a couple of generations time they'll be forgotten about but other things will take their place because language always changes and it's the changes that people notice and which sometimes upset them would it be open to pragmatic analysis to comment on the greater prevalence of the rising inflection, if I'm talking to you like this and I end everything on a, you know, what do we call that now? Up talk, up speak? Up talk, a lot of people call it up talk, yes. Uh, the high rising in, uh, intonation pattern. It, would that be a pragmatic strategy of self-effacement, modesty, tentativeness, non-assertiveness? So it's very definitely pragmatically uh, influenced. It's not, there's nothing new about this. It's important to notice the earliest record I've ever found of somebody noticing up talk and commenting on it is 1775. 
in uh, Joshua Steele's Melody and Measure of Speech. Uh, and he actually mentions this rising inflection, which uh, he, he doesn't like very much. What you have to remember, of course, is that there are an awful lot of accents of English where the high rising inflection or a low rising one, for that matter, is a perfectly normal feature of statements. Uh, so all the Celtic accents, for instance, um, do it. If I'm, I, I live in Wales uh, and if I were to lapse into my Welsh accent uh, and start talking to you like this for the next few minutes, make a few statements. I'm making statements now. I'm not asking questions, uh, not at all. Yes. Uh, and, uh, 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 uh. and if you go to Northern Ireland, it's, it's the same sort of I was thing. About, I was about to jump into the Northern Ireland, yeah. 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 So, you know, the Celtic accents are, are very uh, commonly used this. And people say, well, this uptalk came from Australia uh, or New Zealand. Uh, well, of course, how did it get there in the first place? Yes. Uh, through, through the convict ships, presumably, of uh, centuries ago. <laughs> And certainly in recent times, it's come back in via one of the trends has been via television from um, New Zealand and uh, Australia. But of course, don't forget that the hippies over in California used to do it. OK, you know, and all of this back in the 60s and 70s. So it is very widespread. Now, why has it become so popular recently? That is a pragmatic question, I think. And uh, one of the reasons for it is, well, I think there are two reasons for it. One is semantic and one is pragmatic. Uh, the semantic use of the rising tone is it's a comprehension check. So if I say to you, I live in Hollyhead, this basically says to you, do you know where Hollyhead is? And if you do, let's carry on talking. And if not, tell me. Or do you understand what I said? <laughs> yeah, a semantic question, in other words, um, a semantic is issue here. Yeah. It saves me saying, I live in Hollyhead. Do you know where that is? It's, it's a more economical way of getting around the point. Yes. But the other the other function is definitely pragmatic. And in, it, this point was made when it was noticed that young teenagers, especially teenage girls to begin with, but then everybody later were using it with great frequency to each other as a rapport as a bonding kind of thing. If I'm in that age where I'm not very certain of my peer group or my place in the peer group, and I'm always asking for confidence, as, as it were, and, and response, then this rising tone is one way of, of deferring to your listener exactly. and saying, I'm saying this, but it might not be quite right, but it's up to you to let me know if it is okay, and so on. So, and so these are could, the kinds of discussions that have been taking place. So could we say that it's the, the, the rise of relativism when we're not sure what's right and what's wrong, what's black, what's white, um, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, everything, you know, diversity, every, everything is right, everything is legitimate. So in that, what I feel is, is, is an age of ascending relativism or, or an acceptance yeah. that every behavior is, is normal and acceptable and legitimate. The, the deference and speculativeness that I hear in that rising tone might have something to do with our generation, might be the form and pressure of the age? Well, I think you're, I think that's a very good explanation. And the evidence for it is the way in which the, uh, the, the high rising tone has increased it, its demographic. It's gone up the age range. Yes. Uh, whereas 20 years ago, it was predominantly teenage. Now I hear it everywhere with all ages and, all, you know, all genders, all social situations. I've heard it on the radio many a time now. Um, and it does seem to have spread. Well, it would only have spread if it had that kind of generalized function that you mentioned. Fascinating. Obviously, I spend much of my time coaching British actors in American accents and, and vice versa. And... It's not enough to say bath and bath, is it? It's not enough to... I mean, there are other prosodic and super-segmental issues and even quality of voice that become cultural markers, identity markers. And I wonder if there's a certain pragmatism that separates the Brits from the Americans <laughs> in, in the quality of voice that's used. What is he, says, he says with a high rising tentative tone. Exactly. <laughs> well, um, I think you're right. I think there are differences of this kind. Very difficult to pinpoint them, though. There are going to be differences of intonation, differences of rhythm, differences of uh, speed, of rate, speech rate. Mm -hmm. You know, the stereotype of uh, an American drawl, for example, can 
compared with, you know, a British more brisk uh, manner of articulation. Or even in Britain, you see, you'll get differences between people who speak relatively quickly in the towns versus relatively slowly in the countryside. You know, lots of stereotypes, but the stereotypes do have a basis in, in reality. Yes, it's almost as if values and culture and beliefs and the, and the world view is encoded in our speech, in a way. I, I've often thought that slower speaking cultures you know it's a cliche of, of the southern speech that that we we go slowly and and i've certainly noticed that that some southern speakers seem to avoid the northern cities rush in in order to avoid rudeness it's it's not polite to rush you so let's take our time to talk to each other mm-hmm so fascinating yeah i i've i've never studied this as it were mindset world view whatever you like to call it mm-hmm. um, i have my impressions like everybody else has um, but it's not a, not a subject i've ever explored in in any depth but i one notices the differences straight away and they're crying out for explanation and the explanations are almost certainly going to be bound up with pragmatic and social and and cultural and class distinctions and maybe other things as well i wonder how Meghan markle is going to uh now that, she, now that she's duchess of what is it sussex suffolk sussex yes that's what? right it'd be I mean, very interesting to see i mean noticing the the change in accent in the members of the the other members of the royal family it's been one of the um you know exploratory points over the last 20 30 years or so that prince william prince harry yes thanks to their sojourns in in the forces uh, are now capable of speaking in a much more demotic way compared with the more upper class received pronunciation that presumably they were brought up to use. So they code switch. I've heard them do it. Where I live, Prince William was in the area when he was in the RAF here. And uh, I've heard him talk in a very colloquial, down to earth, glottal stops, all sorts of things yes. that he was. He never does when he was reading a formal speech opening a lifeboat station, for example, you know, and his ability to switch between the two was quite impressive. And I imagine the younger members of the royal family are all like that. Yes. And and yet it's interesting. I was talking to Marilyn just yesterday, contemplating what would pass with the death of Her Majesty. She's the emblem of stability in, in her long, long reign. She appeals to that part of us that wants to know that we have been here forever and that we will be here forever (laughs) and that that things don't change fundamentally. And she's kind of the perfect emblem. Well, yes. Even though over her, if you listen to her Christmas Day messages back to back over the years, her accent has, has definitely modulated over the years. Oh, it has. Yes. Uh, there be, there've been a couple of, um, studies of her speech from the throne anyway, when she's opening parliament over the years. And, you know, you can identify very specific features like uh, 50, 60 years ago. Uh, she'd have said the word M-A-N with a very front articulation, man or man. something like that. Yeah. Whereas today it's much more centralized man or something man. of that sort yeah. or, you know, a very open C-U-P, you know, a cap. 50 years ago and now much more schwa like you know more oh. cap so it is possible to identify change even even there i think exactly a lot of actors that you and i train in op uh, aren't aware of the role of the thou and the you the pronoun let's talk about that i love that little Mm. Area. Well, that's another pragmatic area of course we're talking about the pragmatics of grammar now rather than the pragmatics of pronunciation or, or vocabulary yeah mm-hmm. so it's, a lot of people aren't aware of the difference between the thou and the you and uh, how you can thou someone and how you can use someone and use it as an insult use it as a difference Ex- explain how that works Well, there's always a a difference in the temperature of the relationship when you switch from thou to you or you to thou. Uh, I mean, in the very beginning, uh, it was very straightforward, by which I mean in early Middle Ages, in early Middle English, where thou was singular and you was plural. But then under the influence of French during the Middle English period, exactly the same thing happened in French, you see, where vous became singular as well as uh, tu. Uh, so you began to be used for singulars as well as for plurals. So now there was a choice. And uh, if you're talking to one person, you now have the choice between a thou type 
a form or a, or a U type of form. And it took a while before usage uh, sorted itself out. And indeed, it never entirely sorted itself out. There was always a certain amount of inconsistency. But um, the, the basic thing was that the lower classes would use thou to each other, even in any circumstance, and the upper classes would use uh, you to each other. Um, so uh, with, with a few exceptions here and there. Uh, but it did mean then that if a lower class person switched from thou to you, it would mean something, presumably because he was addressing his superiors or something like this, uh, or maybe having a big row with somebody uh, at his own level. But the ones we notice, of course, are at the upper classes when, when the upper class person switches from you to thou. Now, the reason for the choice can be absolutely anything. It, the whole spectrum of emotions from friendliness to antagonism. So a friendliness example occurs at the beginning of Hamlet. The uh, sentries are on the, on the battlements and there's a switch from, from you to, to thou. Uh, get thee to bed, you know. Have you had quiet guard? The get thee to bed. Hey, mate, off to bed now. We're all friends together here. Hey, what a minute. Has he had some trouble? Have you had? And there's a kind of note of, of uncertainty and the switch from friendliness to official, official status there. Or the more famous example later in the play where Hamlet's talking to Ophelia after his to be or not to be speech. And you get the, the you each other. Have you done this? Have you, have you, have, did you write to me? Have you eyes? I never gave you aught. And all of this, you, you, you. That's what would be expected from a prince to the daughter of the prime minister or whatever Polonius is. And then suddenly get thee to a nunnery. What? Thee? I mean, I can imagine the audience going, wow, he couldn't, he shouldn't do that. He can't do that. It's suddenly a different kind of climate and atmosphere. Temperature change takes place in the interaction. And then the other famous example, of course, in Twelfth Night, where Andrew Egerchik writes a, a letter to uh, Viola disguised as Cesario and um, shows it to Toby Belch. And Toby Belch says, you know, really insult him. Call him thou a few times. If thou thou's him some thrice, that will really get him going. <laughs> so you get the whole spectrum from friendliness to total insult in this switch between thou and you. And it's absolutely fascinating. If people want to study this, it's on ev almost every page of the canon. When does Lady Macbeth and, and, and her husband stop thouing and ewing? You know, how, how do they do it? When does Othello and Desdemona start thouing and ewing? Or when do they stop and how do they switch? You know, each of these relationships involves variation of this kind. It's a shame, we, it's a shame we don't have that pragmatic choice, except in a very few isolated pockets of English, I suppose. I suppose that broad Yorkshire still employs it. Oh, in, re in regional accents, in regional dialects, I'm sorry, uh, in, in this country, and I suppose maybe in some parts of the States too. Oh, it I is think. still there. It is still there indeed. I, I don't know of a place in the, in the States where thou really is used. Yeah. But I, I, don't I, know. I, I wouldn't right. deny that it, it, it's still there. Perhaps in, perhaps on the outer banks in those, in those, um, Atlantic intercoastal islands. There's yep. some very, very strange and wonderful <laughs> accents and dialects to be heard along that yeah. stretch of coastline. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, we, we can't close without me saying how grateful I am for the new Shakespeare's words. Oh, uh, <laughs> it's, I have long been a fan of Shakespeare's words, and if, if the listeners don't know it, go to shakespeareswords.com and you'll find this most amazing companion to the print publication right T tell us what's new in shakespeare's words well it's been a labor of love uh, or hate sometimes oh gosh yes love mainly uh yes yeah, so ben and i uh, wrote the book uh, ben, ben son ben i wrote shakespeare's words originally in around about 2000 or so for one simple reason that people kept asking us uh, and him in particular when he was doing some uh, acting work what the meaning of a particular word was in Shakespeare. And it was difficult to find a place to look it up. Uh, there, there was Onions is Glossary, but that was, you know, 1911. And, yes. and it only had a fraction of the words in. And, and anyway, uh, Onions was assuming a very educated, Latin-orientated readership, which didn't exist anymore. 
And so we thought we must start from scratch. And so we did. And we went through the entire canon word by word by word. And every time we came across a word that had changed its meaning since Shakespeare's day or had fallen out of use since Shakespeare's day, uh, we highlighted it uh, and then logged its occurrence and put it all together, alphabetical order, and then brought out various panels and things to show different aspects of the way the language was used in Shakespeare's time, not just vocabulary, but grammar and pragmatics and everything else as well. And the book came out in 2002 and did very well. Uh, very pleased with it. It's sold like hotcakes. We were delighted, absolutely delighted. And then, of course, uh, it was time for an online edition. So in 2008, we did the first online version, uh, which meant that you could now search very easily. Well, everybody knows now what an online version is. And we felt that that would probably be it until we discovered that an awful lot has happened in the last 10 years in, first of all, computational technology. Uh, now the, two, the 2008 version now seems very clunky compared with the speed at which you can access and search and things uh, these days. Also, uh, we were doing this as it were, almost as guesswork in the 2008 period, Ben and I, we didn't actually know how people would use an online version of what is, after all, a dictionary. So we put in a few features, as many as we thought would be useful. But in the 10 years since then, we've had innumerable responses from people who say, hey, this is great, but it'd be even greater if, and then they'd say something, you know. I mean, to take an example, you can uh, go through the play and say, say you're an actor playing a, a, a part of you know, Ophelia or something. Well, you can go through the play and find your part as you read the play. And there are the difficult words identified at the side. So you can work out what your part is without any having to go to another dictionary or anything. But somebody said at some point a few years ago, it'd be really great if I could have all my lines, just the Ophelia part. I love that feature available and so that feature is now in so you go to the uh, the interactive circles on hamlet which shows all the re character relationships in hamlet and there's ophelia in the middle click on ophelia and up comes the entire line base for ophelia however many lines there is and this is a feature we never conceived of in 2008 but it's turned out to be one of the most popular features of the new the new edition so that's the sort of thing that's happened i think that'll come though in the next year or so give us a sun in op and let's close there a sonnet in OP? I don't know any sonnets in OP. Or, or the prologue to Romeo and Juliet, or anything you like. Is this a dagger that I see before me? The handle toward me hand. Come, let me clutch thee. I have thee not, and yet I see thee still. Or art thou not set fair till vision, sensible to failings to sight, or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation proceeding from the heat oppressed brain? And so on. <laughs> That's the David Crystal that I met and fell in love with in 2005. <laughs> David, it's been an, yeah. uh, the highlight of my life to collaborate with you these last 13, 14 years, and I hope we go on forever. Thanks so much for joining me, Good. David. Thank you, and take care. All, all power to you. Bye. And to my listeners, thanks for joining me. Join me again July 1st when we will celebrate the 20th anniversary of the founding of the International Dialects of English Archive. Idea. Some great stories and recordings from the history of that project. Next time on In a Manner of Speaking. <laughs>